Alyssa Jasmine had a question about immune health. She says, Peter Tia has stated that he thinks he should have added immune health to the content of his book. It appears that immune health decreases drastically with age. Is there something that can be done? Yes, <laughs> there are definitely things that we can do to improve our immune aging. So the first and foremost would be exercise. It's the, one of the most powerful tools we have to counteract age-related declines in immune function. So for example, there's this fascin- fascinating trial in older adults where they 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 basically did about 10 months of moderate intensity aerobic exercise. So here we are with the moderate intensity. There's definitely benefits. They did it three times a week when they got their flu vaccine. And at the end of the study, their antibody responses were significantly higher compared to sedentary controls. So their immune systems behaved more like those those that were younger adults than than the older adults. So that's pretty cool. Would vigorous intensity exercise do the same thing? Yes. But it is harder to get older adults to do a lot of vigorous intensity exercise, particularly if they've been sedentary. There's also some long-term observational studies that kind of have a similar storyline. There was a large Finnish study that showed they followed more than 2,000 people for about two decades, and they objectively measured their cardiorespiratory fitness, and they had a 25% lower risk of developing pneumonia if they had a higher cardiorespiratory fitness. I think that's pretty cool because at least they're actually measuring something, right? It's not like a questionnaire about how frequently they engage in physical activity. They're actually measuring their cardiorespiratory fitness. That's a pretty good marker of their exercise, you know, routines and how how frequently they exercise. And so if they had a high cardiorespiratory fitness, they're 25 percent less likely to develop pneumonia. Um, on the cellular level, there's a lot of evidence mechanistically showing that physical activity really seems to slow what is called immunosenescence. So that is the senescence of immune cells. Senescence means your immune cells are essentially are not functioning anymore. They don't necessarily die off, but they're kind of around in the periphery, not really functioning. In fact, they're they're probably doing more harm than than not because they're secreting, you know, inflammatory cytokines and things like that. And so immunosenescence does play a role in the aging of the immune system because then you have fewer immune cells that are functional, like, you know, T cells or, you know, B cells. So this all kind of contributes to the aging of the immune system. Lifelong exercisers have fewer senescent T cells. So the T cells, as you guys know, they're just a type of white blood cell. They're really important for the adaptive immune system. And they have a lot of functions that play a role in immunity. When they become senescent, they lose their ability to divide and function effectively. So they they so essentially, your T cells are constantly dividing and making making new T cells and things like that, and they're not able to do that anymore. And so you're basically getting this non functional, low grade chronic inflammation, you know, start cycle because those those senescent T cells are now just sitting around doing damage, causing damage. So active people seem to have a lower total amount of these senescent T cells. They also have a healthier balance of what are called naive T cells. So naive T cells are the ones that really, they respond to like a new type of infection that your body's never seen before. So those are the naive T cells. Exercise also boosts the activity of natural killer cells. So natural killer cells, they do target cells that are infected with virus, but they also target cells that are cancerous. So your natural killer T cells are really important for, they're really part of the first line of defense against cancer. So um, exercise also boosts those type of cells. So it's really good, not only for staving off viral infections, but staving off cancer. And also what's really interesting is how quickly, you know, exercise actually mobilizes the immune cells like the natural killer, you know, cells. So basically just like 70 seconds of doing, you know, climbing upstairs kind of briskly can actually elevate their numbers by sixfold, sixfold natural killer cells. So this is why exercise is so important for preventing cancer. And um, what's interesting is that We've had this conversation with Dr. Carrie Kernier, if you remember that that podcast I put out on using exercise as an adjunct treatment to cancer. Exercise was really, really important, particularly intensity, you know, vigorous intensity exercise was really important for 
preventing cancer recurrence, for improving cancer, you know, cancer mortality. So basically lowering cancer mortality risk. And essentially, if you people that already had cancer, the more they exercise, the better the outcome. So it's just really, really important for, you know, long term immune surveillance against both infections and cancer. On top of that, there is some evidence suggesting that, you know, while physical activity sort of acutely will raise inflammatory markers like IL-6 and C-reactive protein, there's a much stronger anti-inflammatory response. And in the long term, it lowers IL-6 and and C-reactive protein. So essentially, it's dialing down, slowing, lowering these chronic inflammatory signals that also accelerate aging as well as immune aging. Resistance training has been shown to increase the activity of immune cells both in young and older adults. But I would say that by and large, the aerobic type of exercise, moderate intensity, vigorous intensity exercise is the most important for, you know, this immune system regulation for improving immune system function, naive t- naive T cell numbers, for increasing natural killer T cells, all those things. Like, so you really want to make sure you're doing some type of aerobic exercise. I would say the actionable takeaway is pretty straightforward. Straight, straightforward. I mean, Again, it comes down to like older adults, you know, if they can at least meet those moderate intensity guidelines, mix in a session or two of vigorous intensity exercise, they're going to be in really good shape. It's really the most reliable, low risk way that you can rejuvenate the immune system, rejuvenate the brain, rejuvenate like cardiovascular system. You know, there's so much, you know, there's so many benefits to cardiovascular exercise that it's just you can't ignore it. You can't ignore it. I don't want to say that resistance training isn't important. Muscular health is also important. But when it comes to really a lot of these, you know, brain function and cardiovascular, your heart, your lungs, respiratory fitness, immune cell aging, aerobic exercise is key. Sleep is another thing that regulates the immune aging, you know, process. So obviously we all know we should be getting at least seven hours, seven to nine hours of good, you know, good uninterrupted, not the normal wake ups, you know, people wake up around 10 times on average per night. But like, beyond that, if you're waking up more than that, most of the time, <clears throat> time, you won't remember the wake ups. But if you start to remember a lot of these wake ups, that's that's really, you know, you're having more fragmented type of sleep. So there's a lot of evidence showing that how much you sleep actually relates to your vaccination response. So for example, people who sleep fewer than six hours a night, and then they have a flu shot, they have a weaker antibody response compared to people that actually get the seven to nine hours of sleep per night. There's also another study that was done in seniors who reported high levels of daytime sleepiness. They also had, so if they they reported those high levels of daytime sleepiness and then they got their flu vaccine, they had lower antibody titers as well. So I think some of this evidence, while it's correlational, really does, it does, you know, if you look at multiple lines of this evidence, it kind of strengthens the I would say statement that you really need to get good sleep to have a strong antibody response. You definitely want to have a strong antibody response if you're being exposed to an illness that you, you know, you've been exposed to previously, but you want to fight it off and not get sick. You want your antibody response to be robust. And it's really not just vaccines. There's also a study where participants were deliberately exposed to a cold virus. And those who were sleeping less than five hours a night were about four and a half times more likely to develop the cold and get the cold symptoms compared to people who are sleeping seven or more hours. That's a really big increase in susceptibility to a cold virus just from inadequate sleep. And that's probably one of the strongest data sets I've seen. So I think mechanistically, really, all of this does make sense. You know, when you don't get enough deep restorative sleep, your body, this is when your body sort of makes and trains T cells. So your white blood cells that usually will recognize and they'll attack viruses, that isn't happening as well. And so sleep is supporting the creation of these new naive T cells and also the activation of existing ones. So really, really important for preventing colds and, you know, infections and helping lower the severity of them as well. Sleep is key, no doubt about it. So really prioritizing, you know, seven to nine hours each night, Um, particularly during the winter months when these viruses are really, they're really circulating more and flu as well. So, you know, these are really important to keep in mind. It's so important to, you know, 
if you had to choose between party party and, and sleep, I would say definitely go with the sleep, um, especially during that time of year. And then there's stress management, right? This is another one that, you know, chronic psychological stress is probably one of the most underappreciated accelerators of immune aging. Chronically elevated cortisol, which is the main stress hormone that we're producing. And I'm not talking about, you know, the acute activation of cortisol. I mean, chronic. This is psychological, emotional stress. This is essentially keeping the body in a low sort of grade flight or, you know, fight or flight sort of, you know, state, right? Where it's you're constantly feeling like you're you're about to like fight or fight. Or what's going on? Do I have to run from threat, you know? And so over time, it's promoting chronic inflammation and that dampens the immune system. So chronic stress elevates this inflammatory cytokine cycle. You're getting more IL-6 without it ever going down. You're getting TNF-alpha. You know, these things are shortening telomeres on immune cells. They're causing immunosenescence. This is accelerating that whole process that we talked about. It's accelerating cellular aging and immunosenescence. And so you really want to get your zen. You want to try to be calmer. You want to buffer any kind of chronic, emotional, psychological, financial, whatever this stress that you're like, that's, that is, is, you know, chronically, you know, in the back of your mind, you got to try to deal with that because it really does accelerate the aging process. It really does not only, you know, make you susceptible to illness, it's also accelerating the aging of your immune cells and your immune cells are going to become senescent sooner. So there's actually there's actually evidence in caregivers. So these are people that are taking care of a spouse with dementia, a parent with dementia, a, you know, any any kind of relative with some sort of, you know, disabling disease where they're just constantly caring for them. These individuals are under high chronic stress. And so when they get a flu shot, their antibody responses are like blunted compared to people that are not caregivers. Um, they even have slower wound healing, and that's also another marker of a compromised immune system because if your immune system is working great, you'll have a pretty speedy wound healing process. So I would say, you know, finding stress reduction strategies is important, particularly in the context of, you know, someone that is, perhaps you are caretaking for someone that's ill or you have you know, there's some kind of chronic emotional stress going on in your life. You want to try to find meditation. I mean, there's like, there's studies showing that even people that do chi Tai Chi, I just got back from China a few weeks ago and it's really interesting. They have these parks that are everywhere throughout China. And I went and I visited a few of them. And in China, you know, the, the people have to retire at a certain age and, I, I forgot what age it is. I think it was kind of younger than I was thinking. Maybe it might have been 55. It was either 55 or 65, but I think it might have been 55. I don't I don't recall. And um and so you have a lot of older individuals that have a lot of time and so they try to find what to do with their time and they're in these parks that have all these sort of exercise equipment and a lot of these people are just there doing tai chi and you can just see them. So they're doing this tai chi. It's really part of their culture. Um, and Tai Chi is interesting. There's been a lot of links to Tai Chi and better vaccine va vaccine responses. So people that do Tai Chi actually have a better antibody titer um, if they're an older adult compared to older adults that don't do Tai Chi. Now, of course, exercise also is another type of way to buffer, you know, chronic stress. And then there's different types of meditation and mindfulness that can also help, you know, as, as well. And in fact, there's some evidence that, you know, mindfulness types of training can cut infections by about a third. And, um, you know, there's all sorts of evidence with meditation and mindfulness stuff as well, improving immune function. So none of this is um, new, but I think it's important to kind of revisit it and keep it in mind. And then lastly, I want to talk about heat and cold exposure. So there's some evidence on both heat and cold exposure that that's interesting because it may also improve immune function. I've talked about this in a couple of podcasts a long time ago, many years ago, but let's start with heat. So we've already talked about the large Finnish study that suggested better immune function with higher cardiorespiratory fitness. I've talked about that many times. Well, the study also found that those who use the sauna two to seven times, anywhere between two to seven times per week had about a 20% lower risk of pneumonia compared to those who used it once or less. And when you looked at men who were both physically active and used the sauna, 
their pneumonia risk dropped by almost 40 percent. So that's kind of interesting. And we know mechanistically the sauna exposure increases circulation. It boosts white blood cell number. Um, and sorry, it boosts white blood cell mobilization. It does a lot of this, the same similar stuff that, you know, moderate intensity physical activity is doing. And then there's the heat shock proteins, which help repair cellular damage. There's also some evidence that's interesting with cold exposure, deliberate cold exposure. I would say the evidence is a little more mixed, but there's some promising sort of interesting data. There's one large randomized control trial that had about 3,000 participants doing a finish. Um, they they basically, they were doing their, their showers, 30 to 90 seconds of cold water every day for a month. And they were followed for about 60 days. And so you could basically, they could choose whether or not they were going to take a cold shower or not, right? Whenever they liked. And there was also a cold control group that did not do the cold shower. So those who actually did the cold shower had fewer illness days, but they reported about a 29% reduction in sick leave from work. Um, So this really suggests that their, you know, their illnesses were perhaps milder, shorter, um, which is a meaningful effect. Like if you're going to get a cold, it's much better if the cold is two days versus, you know, seven days, right? So Cold exposure spikes norepinephrine. We've talked about this as one of the most consistent physiological responses you see with cold exposure. That may actually activate, the norepinephrine may activate immune cells and actually sharpen the stress response. There's, of course, caveats, you know, prolonged or extreme cold stress actually suppresses immunity. So I would say, you know, the short sort of brief cold exposures, maybe, you know, a quick cold shower, a quick dip in your cold plunge, if you have one, um, might be beneficial, but you don't want to like, you know, prolonged cold exposure can actually have the opposite effect. And then there's other obvious things that are pretty, I don't know that I need to go into detail, that can dampen the immune system. Smoking and alcohol being the top of the list. I mean, every former smoker, you know, is is basically, they they basically have twice the risk of developing Current smokers have twice the risk of developing pneumonia. Even former smokers ha- have about a 50% higher risk. So smoking really does affect respiratory illness for one. Alcohol de- depresses the immune system. Both of those things are just not not really good for having a good functioning immune system. Nutrition is also important. You know, there's a there's probably it's probably one of the most overlooked drivers of immune decline in older adults because they're simply not getting enough protein. They're not getting enough key micronutrients. So protein, uh, amino acids, basically, they're really important for increasing lymphocyte counts, uh, lowering infection rates. You know, I take the glutamine, but protein in general is really good for immune function. It's part of the story. I mean micronutrients are also important, vitamin A, C, E, B6, B12, folate, minerals like zinc and selenium. These are all really important cofactors for immune enzymes. They're important for lymphocyte development, you know, and this is why it's important to eat foods like that are fruits, that are vegetables, you know, legumes, fish, nuts. These all have a lot of these micronutrients in them. A Mediterranean style diet, for example, has been one of the most consistently consistent diets that's been associated with lower inflammatory biomarkers and healthier immune function um, across the board. When it comes to supplements, you know, I personally find there's a a few supplements that are really meaningful for immune function. Vitamin D is one, making sure you're not vitamin D deficient. You know, zinc is another critical one. And then vitamin C, omega-3, glutamine, something I take. Probiotics and prebiotics is some interesting data there that, you know, there's a couple of randomized controlled trials that probiotics reduce the risk of upper respiratory tract infections, shortens illness duration, um, prebiotics and probiotics may improve vaccine responses. So, you know, gut microbiome health is also very connected to immune function as well. And then finally, some polyphenols show promise. So like there's some healthcare workers that took green tea catechins and theanine. These are both found in you know, um, the green tea catechins and theanine are found in tea, specifically green tea, and they had significantly fewer influenza infections over the winter season compared to placebo group. So that's pretty interesting data as well. Um, I think there's just a lot of things that you can do. And I think those are my, that's the, that's the top list of the things that I would recommend in terms of improving immune aging, not only you know, as we age, but also improving immune function in the short term to help make sure that we're not getting sick as often. 